Today we're going to talk about the fear of the wicked. Interesting title. You say, well, uh, you're talking about a Christian fearing the wicked. Well, sort of, but not really. You say, well, then you're talking about uh, the way that the wicked fear God. Getting closer, but not really. The sermon's going to be about how and why the wicked fear you as a Christian. You and me. You can turn in your Bible first to Deuteronomy chapter 11. I'm going to go to verse 22. Start reading. This sermon today is going to be... There's some doctrine, definitely. There's some doctrine, but it's more of an exhortation to you as a Christian uh, not to worry about the lost people. Uh, this was a really convicting study for me to put together. The Lord really showed me some interesting scriptures how that uh, our fear is very often misplaced when we're afraid of the lost world. Deuteronomy chapter 11 verse 22. Read down through verse 28 here. It says, For if ye shall diligently keep all these commandments which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to cleave unto him, then will the Lord drive out all these nations from before you, and ye shall possess greater nations and mightier, mightier than yourselves. Every place whereon the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours, from the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea shall your coast be. There shall no man be able to stand before you, for the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that ye shall tread upon, as he hath said unto you. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse, a blessing if ye obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if ye will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to do after other gods which ye have not known. Now, of course, I understand that this is speaking to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, and that they were actually physically going out and spreading a kingdom. They were going to war and things like that and fighting with heathen nations. Not for us today in that sense. But instruction in righteousness is very much there for us as Christians. You say, how so? Well, Jews in the Old Testament had a special covenant relationship with God. They still do. That covenant has not been broken and never will be. The Abrahamic covenant. They had that covenant, but they could fall out of God's will. Okay? They were not eternally secure as we are today as Christians. Why? We're part of, we are actually part of the body of Christ. It isn't just that God has a, a special covenant with us as Christians. We are actually physically part of Christ's body. So we have an even greater relationship to the Lord than they did back then. But I find it ironic there that, uh, where is it, verse 25, it says about, God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that ye shall tread upon. Did you know that that's the reaction that you'll get from lost people? Their real true motivation behind lost people not liking Christians? They're scared of us? They are. And we're going to see about that in this study today. But um, also, just another little interesting thing there. Verse 26, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse, a blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if ye will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way, which I command you this day to, do, to go after other gods, which ye have not known. Interesting, because when a Christian starts to go after other gods, like you start to go after mammon, you start to look so much like the world that you're, you don't really scare the world that much. But when a Christian is doing the right thing and they're living and they're keeping the commandments in the New Testament for a Christian, when you are living right as a Christian, you will scare the lost world. And by the way, you will gain spiritual victories uh, before the Lord as well. You're not taking physical land from people and things and whatever else. Uh, you're not doing that, but you will get spiritual victories. You will see spiritual power. The Lord will work through you. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. You don't have to turn there, but it says, Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Just a little reminder there that we are actually members of Christ's body. So we do have 
a, a presence to us here on this earth that a lot of the people will fear. Those people who are Christ rejecting sinners, that they have heard the gospel presented to them, they, they understand that they're sinners and they still reject the Lord. Those people there, they fear you. I don't want to get ahead of myself and say some other things here, but let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 9. You say, well, I don't understand. Why would they fear us? You know, it's just a, a matter of, hey, you don't want to get saved? Don't get saved. Whatever. Just go on living your life. You know, just you go your way, I'll go my way. It doesn't work that way, though. Genesis chapter 9, I'm going to show you why. Verses 1 through 3. Some very interesting spiritual tie-ins again here. Remember, the things that were written in a foretime are written for our learning. Okay, these things back here in the Old Testament are written specifically for instruction and in righteousness for us today as Christians. Genesis chapter 9, verses 1 through 3 says, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, and upon, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. Okay, did you see any spiritual tie-ins there for a Christian today? Let's look at a few of these. First of all, you have in the first verse there, be fruitful and multiply. Is that a command for us as Christians? Uh, are there uh, specific aspects of a fruit of the Spirit that we're supposed to manifest? Yeah, absolutely. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23. You can read about that. The fruit of the Spirit. Okay, now, as I've said in another study, they are not nine fruits of the Spirit. They are nine characteristics of the fruit of the Holy Spirit being in your life. Very interesting. What about multiplying? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21 just says about how that we are, uh, God has committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation. So yes, we are supposed to multiply. We aren't just supposed to say, well, I'm saved, that's all that matters. I'm just going to go and live sort of an agrarian lifestyle in peace with nature and just work out my own salvation and try to conquer my flesh or something the rest of my life. No, we're actually supposed to be preaching the gospel to the lost. We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. So we are to bear the fruit of the Spirit, but we are also to multiply the body of Christ. Interesting. But how about there the uh, thing of the different beasts and the fowl and the fish and everything else? Uh, how's that tie in? Well, Matthew chapter 4, verse, verse 19, Jesus says to him about, you know, Come, you know, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Hmm. And 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 22 talks about pigs and dogs being likened to lost people. Lost people that have heard, that have known the way of righteousness, and then they turn from it. And that's not people that are saved, it's just up here, head knowledge. You can hear about the Bible and study the Bible for a while and then just say, ah, no, I don't, I don't want that. That's, you know, I don't want to be saved, I don't want to be a Christian. You can pretend, you know, you can fake Christianity. A lot of people do that. And, you know, they turn from it, and the Bible likens them to pigs and dogs. Dogs being men, pigs being female. Hmm. Interesting. So, again, you see this thing of a, you know, a reference to lost people being like fish and animals. Very interesting. Thirdly, you have the gospel today is to be preached both to clean animals which would be like the Jews there in the Old Testament, and unclean animals. You can read about that in Acts chapter 10, verses 9 through 18. Again, Peter up on top of the roof, and he sees this vision, and this, this you know, sheet coming down, and there's all manner of animals in there, and the Lord says, Arise, kill and eat, you know, essentially. And you know, he's like, well, not so, Lord, because there's unclean animals in there. And the Lord's like, I've cleansed them. Don't call them unclean. Hmm. And of course, it's a it's in type. It's it's picturing that now both Jews and Gentiles can be saved. Jews and Gentiles can now come together and fellowship as brothers and sisters in Christ, because we're Christians. We're part of the same body. But also another interesting thing there, which uh, ties into dispensational teaching, 
Notice verse 3 in Genesis chapter 9. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. What about the Old Testament laws? Don't eat this. This animal's unclean. Don't eat that. Don't eat this. Don't eat that. What about that? That doesn't come till later. So what's going on here before the giving of the law lines up with today. You have over in 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 4 and 5. It talks about every creature of God is good and nothing be refused. You know, if it be received with thanksgiving and, and prayer. Or no, if it be received with thanksgiving for it's sanctified by the word of God in prayer. You know, so what do you have? You have before the giving of the law, many of the things before the law came through Moses. Many of these things back in the Old Testament here actually line up with us today. It's very interesting. So you see that there as well. But it's kind of interesting because, you know, the Bible here is, is specifically talking about different animals and their and meat and everything. Um, and not things to be refused. Well, it's, it's kind of like the way, you know, you can use this again in type. Um, there's nobody that's off limits for a Christian to witness to. There's no kindred out there, no, no type of person that the Lord would say, ah, don't, don't witness, witness to that person there. Don't, don't, no, not that one there. Anybody can be witnessed to right now. The God, you know, and you know, right now, the way that the gospel is, yes, you can witness to anybody. But ironically, in the time of Jacob's trouble, you know, uh, it won't be true anymore. And, you know, back in the Old Testament there, too, under the law, you had, it was basically God dealing with the Jews, and, and there were times when he would allow other nations to come, but they had to become part of the nation of Israel, you know. And in the time of Jacob's trouble, we're going to go, it's not we, the people that are here for that time, they're going to go into a similar situation as well, because in that time, somebody takes the mark of the beast, you can't witness to them. Somebody that has taken that mark and worshipped the beast, they're lost. There's absolutely no way to get somebody like that saved. See, we don't have that situation today. That's, again, another proof for the pre-trib rapture. The body of Christ, with our current dispensation, with the current gospel that we have, we have to leave before that time of Jacob's trouble can come in, when God starts to deal specifically with the nation of Israel. That's why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. I constantly have to say that, you know, not only to uh, convict the people that still believe and hold to a post-trib rapture or mid-trib or whatever else, but also just for the brethren out there that get, you know, you get frustrated after a while with some of this stuff. But the real point that I want to make here with this passage is, why is it that wild animals will attack you? Is it because they're angry? No. Is it because they're hungry? Well, somewhat. The main reason that an animal, a wild animal, will attack you is because they're afraid of you. And it's interesting because in the New Testament, like I said, lost people are compared to animals. And another one I didn't mention here, but uh, how about Revelation chapter 13? What's the wild animal there? The beast? Word given for the Antichrist? Hmm. I don't want to get ahead of myself too much here, though, because we will be talking about that later. But uh, as a Christian, you need to understand and you need to remember that we do have power that comes to us, our relationship with God, and you know through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that power, the lost people, they don't even understand it a lot of times. A lot of times they don't even understand what all is going on and whatever else. But all they know is they just... There's something about you that scares them. That's why there's so many of them trying to pass laws against us. You know, it always makes me laugh. You know, you'll see these people. Like, I remember there was this Greek Orthodox priest in my post-trib rapture thieves study. And he was talking about how that the pre-trib rapture belief is going to lead some Christians to do violent things. And I thought, huh? And, you know, because he's saying that, that we interpret the book of Revelation literally, so that's going to be us doing these things. Well, um, if you read the, the book of Revelation, literally, you'll see that it's God that's pouring out these judgments, not man. So why would you come after us? You know why? Because we remind these lost people of God. We're connected to God. 
Let me go over some verses of comfort here in the book of Psalms. Some really neat verses to keep in mind for these times that we live in. Psalm 3. Turn your Bible to Psalm 3. You know, I'll, I'll be very honest with you. There, there are times it gets a little bit, um, you know, you get kind of down and you just get to thinking to yourself, man, you know, how much more of this is the Lord going to have to, you know, let us hear for and put it, you know, put us through and everything else. And, you know, you, you start, you can get fearful, you know, of man and you start thinking, boy, this could happen. There could be another war. There could be a military takeover. There could be martial law. There could be concentration camps, you know, uh, all kinds of things like this. You know, you start to get fearful. You see the Catholic, you know, system taking control here in America and getting more and more power. I mean, openly. I'm not talking the through the Protestants and whatever and their daughters and things. I'm talking open Roman Catholicism getting more and more powerful. You know, you, know, you can get fearful. That's why you go back to the book of Psalms many times and you can be quite encouraged by this. Psalm 3 going to read the entire thing. It's only eight verses, so it's good. Psalm 3, verse 1. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Very true for today. Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. The atheists tell you. Selah. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah. I laid me down and slept. I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people, Silah. Hmm. Very interesting. Very true for David, but even more true for us. Interesting in the New Testament, you read about the sure mercies of David. God had special grace for David because David's heart was right with God. And what did we read earlier back there in, uh, what was it, Deuteronomy chapter 11, about how that God has a blessing and a curse? A blessing if you keep his word and, and follow his commandments and things. A curse if you turn after other gods. You know the reason that America still has some blessing upon it? Because there's still a lot of Bible-believing Christians here that have not turned against God. That's why. And let me tell you something, Christian. If you do right before God... And if you do are doing right and you've, you're getting junk out of your homes and false idols and stuff away, and that can come in a lot of different forms and things. I mean, as I've said in other studies, my wife and I have burned a lot of false idols. Hollywood movies and things and, and even InfoWars DVDs, if you've seen that video. A lot of things like that. I had some occult books because I'm a researcher. I need to, you know, show documentation. That's why I did that. And it was just like the Lord convicted me and just pff, get rid of them. I had a lot of these new versions. The Lord convicted me, get rid of them. You know, it's a the the life as a, as a, of a Christian. That sanctification process is a purifying process. And you know, there's still probably things here that are not pleasing to the Lord, and and uh, I mean nothing real bad or anything like that. But I'm always open to the Lord. The Lord says, "Hey, get rid of that thing." Yes, sir. Okay. Why? I want his blessing. I want to be able to say that I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people. They say, what if there's a martial law takeover here in America? What if the Illuminati trips the trigger and we're all martial laws declared in America? Well, I believe the Lord can save me from that. I believe if the Lord has work for me to do yet, if the Lord has work for you to do yet, he'll get you through that. He'll get you through a war. He'll get you through... You could go to a concentration camp someplace and the Lord will have work for you to do. He'll get you through the thing. I really believe that. Turn next to Psalm 25. Yeah, we can really get our fear misplaced down here as Christians. And I'm just as guilty as anybody else of that. There have been many times when I've started to fear man and I shouldn't be fearing man. I should just fear God. And that's what this study is about. 
they are scared of us because we are connected to the Lord. The lost world can oftentimes see things in us and about us that we ourselves just take for granted. You know, it's like, you're a member of the body of Christ. Oh, yeah, 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 I know that. Do you really think about it, though? You might know it, but do you really think about that from time to time? That God that created the universe, you're actually part of His body? Connected to Him? As I've said before in other studies, Saul, before he became Paul, is persecuting Christians, and Jesus says to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? So when the lost world laughs at you and mocks you for your stands, who are they really mocking? And you're afraid of what? Psalm 25, verse 1. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Show me thy paths, or show me thy ways, O Lord, teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth, and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Very good, but also very convicting. You know the reason that you don't witness, that I don't witness? There's only one reason. Well, because you fear man more than you fear God and because you're ashamed you say well Brian I, I you know I just didn't have a chance you know the one time I wanted to witness to this guy and he got away from me well not you know I understand there are times like that there's not that door of utterance is not open and whatever but those times when the door is open and you change the subject and talk about the weather or talk about whatever it's because you're ashamed you're fearful you've forgotten your position with the Lord. You say, have you ever done a thing like that, Brian? Oh yeah, I have. I've failed. I've failed the Lord on numerous occasions. And what I get, what I start to do is I start to fear that lost person. What are they going to say? What are they going to do? What if they yell at me? What if they this? What if they that? My fear is misplaced. Turn next to Psalm 34. Psalm 34, verses 1 through 8. It says here, I will, bless thee, or I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Just when you're around saved people, right? When you're in the privacy of your own home, right? You know, a good way to, to uh, get some courage out there in the, in the lost world and, and, you know, is to praise the Lord for things. Somebody comes up to you, hey, that's a really nice whatever, you know, you have there. Oh, well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord continually. Verse 2, My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lighted, lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him, and delivereth them. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Hmm. You know, there's a lot of channels here on YouTube and they get a lot of views and they get very popular. And they talk about the Illuminati plans uh, for 2015 and they talk about how the Illuminati killed this celebrity and killed that celebrity and how the Illuminati's planning this and how the Illuminati's planning that. And we're all probably going to, this is probably going to be the year for us. You know, and I know a lot of you out there have been through the conspiracy world, you know, the gamut of conspiracy theories and you've gone through and, and there's some that are kooky and nonsense. There's others that are real. There are conspiracies. There are there is a group called the Illuminati. There is the Jesuits. There's all this different stuff. That's there. But you know, you can get so so focused on that that you begin to lose your fear of God. 
and you begin to put your fear on them. You misplace your fear. And I'm going to tell you right now, when you start to do that, and you start to take your eyes away from the Lord, and you start to put them on the world and fear the world more than you fear God, you know what happens? God won't protect you. The angel of the Lord encampeth around about them that are aware of the Illuminati and delivereth them. No. The, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that uh, know the inside uh, plan and system of the Jesuit order and what they have planned for 2015. No, it doesn't say that. It says, them that fear him. The angel of the Lord is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. You read about that in the book of Acts, I think it is, where Paul says about the angel of the Lord appeared to me this night, whose I am and who I serve. You know? So why is it that we get so afraid of man? You know, how many times have there been people that have had situations with their job or whatever else? And I, I mean, I've seen this thing many, many times, talk to a lot of different brethren and they're having problems at their job or whatever else. And it's like, if I'm witnessing on the job, I'm getting in trouble. And they're just like, I've seen guys, they say, well, I guess I just have to quit witnessing. Um, well, you shouldn't be standing around witnessing and talking to people about the Lord and not doing your work. I understand that. You're there to work. That's fine. But if they start telling you, if your boss starts to tell you, hey, I don't want you talking about Jesus Christ in here at this, wherever you're working. Are you going to fear Him or are you going to fear God? You say, well, Brian, I could lose my job. And you think the Lord can't take care of you? You think the Lord can't uh, provide some other way for you? Oh, well, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what insurance is? Fear of man. That's what it is. People go out and they get insurance policies for all kinds of things because they fear situations down here on earth. What if this happens? What if that happens? What am I going to do? Don't you think God can take care of you? The entire book of Job wouldn't have even happened if Job had had insurance. Life insurance policies on all of his children, boy, he'd have made a lot of money. Job feared God. God looks down and he says, there's Job, a perfect man, upright man, you know, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Hmm. How much do you really fear God? Heard a story of a farmer the one time back down in Lancaster County. I don't know who he was or whatever. It was just an older man telling the story. And he had a lot of cattle. And, um, and you know, he got, to, he got this big insurance policy on all these cattle and they were all insured and everything else. And I forget how the thing was or whatever. And uh, he just got convicted and he said, you know, I have this big insurance policy on all these cattle. It's like I don't trust God to take care of me. So he dropped the insurance policy. And a short time after, if I remember the story correctly, a short time after that, the cattle were destroyed. Some big storm came up and whatever killed a bunch of the cattle. You say, well, what happened then? I guess he, he got his insurance policy and no. He kept on trusting the Lord, and in fact, that I forget the exact details, but that those cattle dying actually turned out to be an even greater blessing. You know, he was able to sell them or do some other kind of a thing, or some kind of thing happened, and God blessed him even greater. The Lord will do that for you when you fear Him and not man. Psalm 37, we were there, 37. Verse 23, Psalm 37, verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. Depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. For the Lord loveth judgment and forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. The mouth of the righteous speaketh wisdom and his tongue talketh of judgment. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. The wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. 
Why? Why do the wicked watch the righteous and seek to slay us? Because they're scared. They're afraid of us. You know what the devil is doing right now? The devil, through Hollywood and through all the other popular you know, religious cult movements out there and everything, the devil is preparing his army. Because the devil knows his only shot at trying to get out of the lake of fire for eternity is he can't get saved. There's no way. That's not going to happen. Jesus didn't die for him. You know, He's already been kicked out. He's already been cursed by God. So the devil knows the only way that he can possibly try to thwart God's plan is by raising up the biggest army that's ever been on this earth. A 200 million man army. And of course, if you read Revelation chapter 19, you know, you know what happens to that army. But uh, the point is, right now, he's trying to raise up all these people. And we can already see, I believe that, that we are rubbing shoulders, literally, with you know, walking out there in society. I think we're walking around with people that are going to be part of that army. I really do. I don't see it as, well, it might happen 100 years from now or something. Oh, no, no. I think that a lot of the people that are alive right now today on earth, your co-workers, your friends, maybe even members of your family, they're going to be members of that Antichrist army, that 200 million man Antichrist army. I firmly believe that. You know, And they already have that hatred in them, don't they? They already have that hatred. You, you know, what you're saying is very dangerous. And that's hate crime. And you're... You should be put. You should be locked up for that. You're you're mentally sick. You know the psychiatrist said that you have delusions of grandeur and you have this and you have you have all these things wrong. You ought to be locked up. People like you ought to be put in camps and 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 you know tortured to death and things. That's the way a lot of these people feel. That's the whole sodomite agenda. All these sodomites out there. You know why they hate Christians so bad? Because we're a constant reminder to them of their sinful nature. You get a, a Christian man and, and, his, and his wife and their children walking through a store and those sodomites see you and they hate you. They do. You represent God. You're God's representative. It's kind of like if you had some foreign country and there's ambassadors there from America and the people, they look and they see you and they see you're different and they're like, thinking American ambassadors, you know. Well, we're ambassadors of Jesus Christ. So that lost world, they see us and they fear us because ultimately we're tied to God. They fear God. So we are a reminder of them, of that judgment that's going to come on them someday. That's why they hate us. That's why the wicked watcheth the righteous and seeketh to slay him. I'm dealing with that thing all the time now. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, I've, I make videos of it just simply to document the thing of Google messing with my channel. They're messing with it all the time now. You know why? Because they're afraid. They're scared. But I'm going to tell you right now, God's going to keep the ministry going until He decides, okay, you're not going to be on YouTube anymore. And by the way, you know, remember that we are on Sermon Audio. SermonAudio.com uh, forward slash, I think it is, KJVM. You know, so if you don't want to be vexed by all the other junk here on YouTube and stuff like that, you just want to watch sermons like this, go over there to... to uh, our sermon audio page and you can watch them there so just wanted to put that in there and say that but uh, let's continue here Psalm 40 Psalm 40 verses 9 through 11 interesting numbers Psalm 40 verse 9 through 11 I have preached righteousness in the great congregation lo I have not refrained my lips O Lord thou knowest I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Withhold not thou thy tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me. <laughs> oh boy, how about that one? How many of you have been rebuked because you went to the great congregation, you were in some Bible building or even around other people, and you preach God's truth. You talk about the Bible and you say, hey, you know, the Bible says this and the Bible says that, you know. 
you don't hide those things and, and, and just kind of keep quiet. And you hear people talking about sodomy and whatever else and stuff, and you just kind of keep your mouth shut. Openly proclaim it. And God will preserve you if you do that. Psalm 96. Psalm 96, verses 9 through 13. We'll read these verses here. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before Him all the earth. Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established, and it shall not be moved. For He shall judge the people righteously. Let the heavens rejoice, and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar, and the fullness thereof. Let the field be joyful, and all that is therein. Then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. One day, all the world is going to be judged by this standard right here. The Word of God. The King James Bible for the English-speaking people. You know, and I realize there are equivalents of this book in other languages, maybe not every language out there, but the point is. God has a standard. It's a written standard, so nobody can duck it. They can't say, well, it's, it's oral tradition. It's oral things that have been passed down. No, 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 it's written. God put it in writing, and you will be judged. Okay? These words that Jesus Christ has spoken, the same shall judge you in the last day. The Bible talks about that. You know, this standard, this written standard, is one day going to be your judge out there. All of our judges, you know. And for those who are saved, the only judgment I have to worry about is judging my works. And same thing with you if you're saved. Your works will be tried by fire, but you won't be. Okay? Our judgment already happened. When you get saved, your judgment happens at the cross. That's where you're judged. All right? After that, yeah, your works are going to be judged. That's true. But your judgment is at, at the cross. Lost people, your ultimate judgment is going to be the great white throne judgment. And if you make it to that, you're not getting out. You're not going to say, well, Lord, I think I've been a good person. He's going to say, well, you know, I think you were. <laughs> no, you weren't. No, that's not going to happen. And by the way, again, it's another good antidote for fearing man when you remember that everybody's going to be judged. There's nobody down here, I don't care how, how arrogant and, and, you know, whatever, uh, big of a jerk they are to you or put you down or whatever else, treat you poorly as a Christian, everybody's going to be judged. Saved, you get judged at the cross and your works are judged. Lost, you go to the great white, white throne judgment. And the most evil, scary, Illuminati, insider, international banker, blah, 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 they're going to show up at the same judgment as any bum in the street that rejected Jesus Christ. You know? I mean, Christians, I think, a lot of times give too much credibility to the Illuminati. You say, well, they're so powerful. No, they're not. The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You know? The Illuminati is a bunch of decrepit old men. You know, half of them are partly inbred because they're marrying in with their own little families and stuff, the 13 families and whatever else. And they're, you know, hiding themselves and scared and running and keeping away from the public eye and everything else. And you're afraid of these guys? Well, Brian, they're, they're bringing about a new world order. Uh, no, the Lord's bringing about the new world order. Read about in the book of Revelation. Jesus Christ is the one that opens the seal that unleashes the Antichrist and brings in world government. You know, the Bible says that by Jesus Christ, it says, by Him all things consist. Everything in the world, their life is dependent upon Jesus Christ. And you're tied into his body if you're saved. So why are you afraid of people that are lost? Kind of crazy, isn't it? Psalm 101. Psalm 101, verses 1 through 8. I will sing of mercy and judgment unto thee, O Lord, will I sing. I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. O when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. How do you walk within your house with a perfect heart? 
Verse 3 is a real good one for you to remember. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. I printed that out on my printer, and I have that stuck to the top little frame area of my monitor, my computer monitor. I want to have that thing continually as a reminder not to set wicked things before mine eyes. You know, I rip on television a lot, but you can get just as messed up, you know, and even more so messed up watching things online. You can watch very, very filthy, horrible things on YouTube even that you aren't going to find on television. You say, well, then the Internet's worse than television. No, because with the Internet, you actually have a choice. Television, you turn the thing on, they're, fe they're force-feeding it to you. Stay away from television. Verse 4. A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. Who are your friends? Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath an high look and a proud heart will, I, will not I suffer. Mine eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that work, walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. I will early destroy all the wicked of the land, that I may cut off all wicked doers from the city of the Lord. How are you living? Are you cleaning up your life? Are you repenting of things? Are you, are you allowing the Lord to come in and tell you what you should be watching and should be listening to and, and how you, you should live your life? Or are you just kind of doing your own thing? Because you fear men? You don't want to look too odd as a Christian, you know? You want to fit in? Now let me ask you a question. Did people fear Jesus? Turn first to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, verse 18. Okay, it says here, And behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and led him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? They didn't even recognize who Jesus Christ was there. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts? Whether is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins, he said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy couch, and go into thine house. And immediately he rose up before them, and took up that whereon he lay, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. Now look at this, verse 26. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear saying, we have seen strange things today. That would be strange to see. Certainly would. Go next to Luke 7. Luke 7, verse 11 through 16. It says here, And it came to pass the day after that he went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him and much people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had, had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bier, and they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all. And they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God hath visited his people. Um, we can read about it, and we can kind of perceive it and say, yeah, you know, okay, whatever, that's, you know, wow, that would have been amazing. 
but we don't often really think about that. I mean, you're someplace and you see there's this comes this funeral procession and this guy walks up and he says, hold on a second. And he goes over in that dead that casket there and he flips the lid open and he says, arise, get up. And this dead body there, you know, it's it's this lifeless dead body and it, it sits up. Gets out of the coffin, walking around, you know, looking around. Hey, hey, uncle. Hi there, grandma. How you doing? You know, thanks for coming to my funeral, but you know, I had to kind of disappoint you there. <laughs> you know, you talk about causing some fear. Yeah. Well, then they all respected him after that, right? They all, everybody just wanted to follow Jesus because obviously he's doing these miracles. He must be God, right? Wrong. John chapter 19 No, they didn't fear the Lord after they saw that. They actually hated Him that much more because they were scared. It's kind of like you see a wild animal out there and and uh, you're out in the woods or whatever and you see this wild animal and he's pretty far away and he just kind of, you know, kind of looks back at you, some bear or something like that. He just kind of looks back at you. You know, you're a good two, three hundred yards away from him. And the bear just kind of like, yeah, you know, stay over there, okay? Well, most bears won't come charging from 300 yards or something like that. But uh, you start closing the distance yourself, you get closer, that bear's going to get more afraid of you. And he's going to want to come after you. Why? He's scared to death of you. That's why a lot of the lost people out there, they're just living their nice little happy life. And all of a sudden... They come into contact with you and it scares them and they can kind of just you know put their head down and just kind of walk the other way or whatever or you know uh, you're out tracting or whatever and you go to hand a track to them and it's like you're handing a rattlesnake to them you know they're like oh no 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 you know they, they get all scared you know a good experiment to do if you want to see this in if you want a scientific experiment go take a tract and go and put it at some public place you know, uh, some place where it can be clearly seen. I mean, I had these ones. Uh, see if there's, yeah. I made these these tracks years and years and years ago, um, back when I was down in Pennsylvania. But uh, these ones here, these, are you good enough to get the heaven tracks? You know, and they're they're bright orange or like fluorescent orange paper. Oh, and <laughs> these things, you'd put these things out on a on a table or some place, you know, and that and you know, display thing or whatever in a store, just sitting there like that, big letters, are you good enough to get to heaven? And you'd see people come over and they'd just be like looking around, you know, and right here's the track, you know, like this, and they're like looking around, like, and they grab products around it, and it's just like, I don't see anything, I don't see anything. <laughs> you can see that. People are afraid. They don't want to pick up that tract. They're afraid what's in it, and they're afraid what people around them are going to think. And if you come up to them and you say, hey, why don't you read that? Nine times out of ten, that person's going to be scared to death of you. And they're going to go, oh, well, no, 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 no. They're, they're going to get scared. That's why they come up with words like discrimination, narrow-minded bigot, hate crime, all this other stuff. They're frightened by you. But now we're going to see what they did to Jesus Christ. John chapter 19, verse 1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Look at Pilate's reaction. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. And went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, 
Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? <laughs> Ooh, you know, wow, big power here. Verse 11, Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. Notice real quick there before we continue, what was Pilate worried about? His own hide. First he's worried about, you know, if I falsely try this guy, if I falsely convict this guy, you know, I'm going to have a, this false phony trial. I'm going to get in trouble for that. And then he's like, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not crucifying this guy. You know, I find no fault in him. He's, you know, I'm not going to go against our criminal justice system. But then the Jews remind him, hey, he is speaking against Caesar. He's making himself a king. So if you don't go against him, then you're not Caesar's friend. You're going to get in trouble for that. Pilate was a man pleaser. He feared man more than he feared God. Let's continue. Verse 14. And it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. And they cried out, Away with him, away with him. Crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. Okay, of course, you know that story if you're saved. But you see that whole thing there that Pilate was afraid of Jesus. Yes, definitely afraid of Jesus when he heard that he was the son of God. It scared him. But he feared man more than he feared Jesus. And in Matthew chapter 27, verse 19, we won't go there, but uh, it says here another account of this whole situation. When he was sat down on the judgment seat, uh, his wife said, sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. <laughs> so Pilate's having a pretty bad time. You know, he's, he's having to you know, go against the laws of the land to execute Jesus, and, and he's got the Jews mad at him, and now he's, his job is being threatened. Now even his wife comes to him and is like, don't do anything to that just man. You know, I'm suffering many things in a dream. So, you know, he's got everybody going against him. <laughs> but he still went through with it. Hmm. It's kind of interesting, because if he would have been a real man, he would have just simply said, no, I'm not going to crucify the guy. In fact, I'm going to Set him at liberty. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let him go. But he's a coward. Now the question comes up. Do people fear us as Christians? Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. You have the story here of Ananias and Sapphira. We're not going to read the whole thing, but let's go to verse 5. Ananias lies to the Christians there, the early Christians, Peter, you know, being the one talking here. And he says here, verse 5, And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. So a lot of people were scared. They hear this guy, he just totally drops dead, you know, and it's like he was lying to the Holy Ghost and there and to the Christians and things and he, he was deceitful God dropped him dead interesting jump down to verse 11 there in chapter 5 it says here and great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things so his wife she comes in and you know they're, they've agreed to lie to the Holy Ghost and to you know the Christians there too and she drops dead too 
and great fear comes upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Verse 12, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest, the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. Hmm. So they're scared to the point of saying, wow, those Christians are really something else. You want to join them? Oh, me? No way. No, no, no. I don't want to join them. They were scared of what true Bible-believing Christians were. They could see the power of the Lord upon these people, and they were going, oh, you know, stay away from me. Stay away. You know, and again, you know, I see this thing of, of you know, uh, Joan Rivers comes out and says that, you know, Michelle Obama is a transvestite, and, and she dies shortly thereafter. And it's like, oh, the Illuminati sacrificed her. It was a blood sacrifice and all this other stuff. Or maybe the Lord allowed it to happen. Maybe the Lord said, okay, you're wicked, and she was a very wicked woman, you know, all of her life. You're very wicked, so I'm just going to let the devil have you. And if the devil wants to do some kind of blood sacrifice or whatever, you know, mess him up or whatever else, you know, and same thing with Michael Jackson and same thing with uh, Robin Williams and the same thing with all these other big celebrities. They're dropping dead all the time. You know why? Well, a lot of them are blasphemers. All of them are blasphemers. What am I talking about? You know, they all hate God. Why would God protect somebody like that? And why do they hate God? Because they fear Him. They don't like the fact of having their sins judged. They don't like to know that there's a guy up there in heaven that's actually going to judge their secrets, their thoughts. Hmm. They don't like that. And so they go their own way, and the Lord says, okay, you want to do your own thing? All right. Now I'm going to let the world just, you know, you're going to die down there. Romans chapter 8. A little bit more encouragement for the saved out there. Romans chapter 8, verse 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yeah. We don't really have anything to be afraid of as Christians. You know, we should live without fear down here. Our fear only should be of the Lord and following His commandments and things. You know? And when we start to misplace our fear and we take our fear from God and we start to put our fear out there in the world and start to get afraid and I don't want to say this on my channel and things like this because what would the Catholics do? I could get in trouble. I could have my channel shut down. I could get in, you know, I, I can't say this thing to this guy at work because he's my supervisor and, and I could get in trouble. I could lose my job and I, you know, whatever, whatever. See? Who do you really fear? Something to think about. First Peter. First Peter, chapter four. First Peter, chapter four, verses one through five. It says here, for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. Interesting, because it's talking about there your lost life, the life that you had before you got saved, and how you would party. And, you know, we did all kinds of sins and stuff like that. I mean, all of us can attest to our wicked life before we got saved. 
and you get saved and all of a sudden you're going, I don't want to do that stuff anymore. And your family, your friends, co-workers, whoever, they're going, you're not going to party for New Year's Eve? Well, St. Patrick's Day is coming up. You certainly are going to get a little bit drunk at least for that. No. Fourth of July? No. How about your birthday? No. You know, all his other stuff? No. I don't need to do that stuff anymore. I fear God. And you know, that'll convict people and they won't like you too much. Oh, you're judging me. You're judgmental. You're, you're narrow-minded. You're, you know. Yeah. That's what will happen. Jump down to verse, uh, verse 12. There in the same chapter. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Yeah. Again, how often do we not witness? How often do we not speak what we know we should because we're worried about that reproach coming upon us? And yet the reproach is what we're supposed to be having. And I'm not talking about going out of your way just to be a jerk to people and arrogant and whatever else just to make people mad and then saying, people were mad at me and now I'm righteous. No, 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 no. Just speak the truth in love to people. Lost people are going to get mad at you. You're not going to get along with them, you know. And it's, you know, it's kind of interesting. Another little point I want to make, just like a, a an animal, lost people, you know, uh, they an animal doesn't really have much of a conscience. You know, they, they just basically are very fleshly in terms of they just want to eat and sleep and procreate and play around and stuff, and that's about it, you know. And lost people are very much the same way. They don't really want to think much about spiritual things. Hmm. It's kind of funny because it's like they spend all their time trying to kill their conscience, and when you come by, you represent their conscience. So they want to kill you. You know? I mean, they spent all this time convincing themselves that sodomy is okay. And then we as Christians come along and say, actually, the Bible says. And they go, you know, how dare you? How dare you speak against my lifestyle? You know, how dare you speak against this? Or how, how dare you speak against that? They spend all their time trying to convince themselves that they're right. And they don't like you and they're afraid of you. Because they know that you're right. They know that you're right with God, that you are part of God, part of his body. Okay? Through the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? Let me clarify that. But what about uh, will people fear the saved in the time of Jacob's trouble? It's coming up. Revelation 6. Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. People already hate this book, but it, the hatred of this book is going to be tenfold when the rapture happens. And I believe that the children, the, the children that, that are under the age of accountability, little babies and things like that, I believe that they're going to be leaving. You know, and you can argue that back and forth, I know. I can't be super dogmatic that the Bible directly, openly spells it out, but I do believe that if you look at scripture and everything, compare it. I did a pre-trib rapture moment on that. You know, I do believe that the children are going to be leaving. So when that happens, they're going to hate Christians like never before. And the fear is going to come upon these lost people because some of them in their heart, you know, they're going to realize this was God's doing. And then they're going to start to see the book of Revelation coming to pass. 
you know, and I realize there will be some that are just going to be so they're going to kill their conscience to the point where they're just going to be like, oh, I don't even want to think about it, whatever. But a lot of them, you know, especially when you get towards the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, the Bible says the mystery of God will be finished. Okay, so in Revelation chapter 10, and I believe that there will be no atheists at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. But yet there's still people that hate God. Kind of weird. Turn next to Revelation chapter two or chapter eleven. Excuse me, Revelation chapter eleven. Revelation chapter eleven, verse two. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues, as often as they will. Okay, let me just stop there. Uh, does it sound like they're going to be very popular with the world? No, <laughs> they're not going to be liked too much by the world. But notice verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, not before then, you see, any man tries to hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their, their enemies. God protects them until their work is done. And brother, sister, in Christ, God will protect you until your work is done. God's going to protect me until my work is done. God will preserve the life of his saints and deliver us from the hand of the enemy. He'll deliver us from that evil people. I mean, America right now, it is just a miracle from God, it is God's doing, clearly God's doing, that this country even is still existing. All the national debt that we have and all the other things, and I mean, just, I mean, we are shipping in, Americans eat so much food and we're just shipping in so much food and it's just like, and yet it still keeps going on. We still have electricity, we still have food, we still have money in the bank and clothes on our backs and whatever else. Why? Because there's work being done. We're doing work for the Lord, so the Lord's keeping things going. Verse 7, we'll start here again. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Why? Because he's afraid of them. He's afraid of what they represent. Verse 8, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and in half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and in half the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Interesting because that's the same thing Jesus did. That funeral, you know, they're carrying the, the dead, God, dead guy's body, dead guy's body, I'll get it out yet, yeah, out, and his, you know, his mother's a widow, and that's his, her only son and everything, and the Lord says, stop, get up, you know, rise up, young man, you know, and, and everything, rise him from the dead. And it's like, and fear fell upon the people. Same thing there. Interesting, very interesting. Verse 12, And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. There's going to be a lot of fear in the time of Jacob's trouble. Let me tell you. And, uh, you know, just another little proof. I know some of you have commented on this, but in case you haven't seen some of the comments in, down in the comments section, the thing of the two witnesses, uh, the Bible does teach that they are Moses and Elijah. It cannot be Enoch. And there was a good point that was raised, 
and I didn't have it in my study, but I need to say it right now, and that is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5 says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him, for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. So another proof there that Enoch cannot be one of the two witnesses, because the Bible plainly teaches that he is not going to see death. Okay, he pictures a Christian that is living at the time of the rapture. All right? Enoch was taken out before God's worldwide judgment. There are only two worldwide judgments in the entire Bible. The flood in the days of Noah and the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? The flood in the days of Noah was a bad thing, but it's nothing compared to the seven year. Seven years. <laughs> the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? That's going to be the worst time period, the worst judgment ever in history. Ever. And both times, God must remove the righteous before his judgment can come out. I mean, it's, it's, it's simple, people. You know, well, the pre-trib rapture, it's, you, you know, it's really a, a difficult thing. You've got to get back and forth. Not really. Not really. I mean, if you understand the way that the Lord does things, you know, he always removes the righteous before his judgment comes. That's why he's just. A God of justice and judgment. And you know, don't don't say, oh, what about the martyrs? What about the martyrs? God didn't persecute the martyrs. Okay? But let's continue. Revelation chapter 13, verse 5. It says here, And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Okay, speaking of the Antichrist, the beast we talked about earlier. He is a beast. A beast is afraid of man. This beast is going to be afraid of saints in the time of Jacob's trouble. And that doesn't mean the body of Christ, for crying out loud, okay? Saints is a generic term that can be used for saved people in any dispensation. All right. So in, interesting there, the Antichrist fears God and he blasphemes God because he's afraid of God. It's kind of like a bear growling at a man or, you know, a mountain lion that's, that's you know, hissing and sting, things. They, they kind of like, you know, like that, you know, at, at people. And... Um, and I've seen both of them in the wild, by the way, and it and it's, you know, never had any kind of, uh, they didn't get real close or anything, but uh, it's definitely a weird feeling. But, um, you know, just goes again, it ties into this whole thing of man fearing saved people because they're connected to the Lord. But uh, let's continue here. Revelation chapter 18. We're going to go next. Three more passages to go to today. Revelation chapter 18, verse 8 through 10. It says here, Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth, who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament for her, when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off, for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. Okay? So, these people are afraid when they see God's judgment. Again, you see that whole thing there. And this is Mystery Babylon being destroyed, which is the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic system is going to be wiped out towards the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. It's going to be exciting. And if you read over in Revelation chapter 19, which we're going to go there next, uh, we're not going to read the first part of it there, but the, the first, uh, what is it? Uh, it looks like about the first, um, first five verses or so. They're, they're actually, we're actually going to be celebrating in heaven when we see Roman Catholicism destroyed. Certainly looking forward to that. But uh, go down to Revelation 19, verse 19 through 21. It says here, And I saw the beast 
and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Okay, so you have the, rem the uh, wild beast there, the beast, the Antichrist, going out to slay the remnant of the Jews that are left over, the remnant of the saved people there at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. But Jesus comes and stops them dead in their tracks, <laughs> literally dead in their tracks. So, again, this great, powerful new world order that is being formed right now and all the Illuminati and the Council on Foreign Relations and everything else, this is the end of them, right there. And you're afraid of what? Well, I, I don't want to put this on because I, I'm kind of afraid that it, you know, might get me in trouble with, it. with who? Hmm. Well, I'm kind of worried if they come out with hate crime laws and things like this and whatever else because they, that might stop our preaching and teaching of the Word of God and, and that... Huh? And, you know, let me just say that, this, this real quickly here, and that is that I think one of the best things that we can do right now with all this impending persecution that's going to come, because um, I don't know, you know, overlapping here, I don't know if it's going to happen after the time, or after the rapture or a little bit before the rapture that Christians get persecuted and then the rapture happens and then persecution gets worse for the people that are left behind. Uh, I don't know, you know, but I think that that right there is, I think it's kind of an open-ended thing. I mean, the Lord certainly knows when whatever is going to happen happens, but... I think that, that we can play a part in it right now by how much we fight. Okay, it's kind of like that what we read earlier in the, the very beginning of the study in Deuteronomy chapter 11. God has a blessing and a curse. And he's saying, which one do you want? It's up to you. If you keep fighting for me and, and fighting for my cause, I'll give you the blessing. If you turn after other gods, I'm going to give you the cursing. Not the Bible, excuse me. Left hand, you know, the cursing. Well, let's end up here with Revelation chapter 21, verse 7. Revelation 21, verse 7 and 8. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So my final question to you is, who do you fear, God or man? Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, um, Lord, I ask for uh, your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness, Lord, of, for all the times that I have failed you because my fear has been greater of man than it has been of you. And uh, Lord, I know we all struggle. We all have our fleshly issues, our times where we are afraid of what people think and or maybe we're ashamed of your word or ashamed of your truth. But Lord, I just really pray that you would give all of us the courage to remember the promises that are in your word that that one day everyone is going to be judged. The most scary people that we're afraid of right now are still going to have to stand before you in judgment one day, Lord, and they will bow the knee then. If they don't get saved now, they will bow the knee and, and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and uh, to your glory and before they're cast into the lake of fire. And uh, every knee will bow, Lord, uh, as your word says. And I just pray that you would help all of us to remember that myself included, Lord. I've, I've failed many times. And I just uh, really pray, Lord, that you would just make it more and more manifest to all of us the courage that we need to have. And um, Because I do believe time is very short. But I pray, Lord, that as time is getting shorter, that we would all run the race even harder than we have in the past. And that uh, we would get that second wind uh, that many runners will experience when they see the finish line up ahead and run harder, run with all of your strength that you have left. And um, I just pray, Lord, that 
You would give all of us strength and courage uh, through your power, Lord, not our own power, not our, not our own strength, but through your power, Lord. And help all of us to remember what your word says and that we can rely on and count on your word for being our standard of truth. And I pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, that's going to be it for this study. Uh, occasionally I like to do a study to just exhort uh, the brethren, and it's an exhortation to myself. Um, there have been many times when, when uh, I know I should have said things and I know I should have done things and I didn't do it because I was afraid of man. And, you know, there are many times I, I get on YouTube and I get kind of frustrated because I see that, that I'm being persecuted. You know, and, I, and like I said, I, I've said this in other studies, I understand, I'm not, when I say I'm being persecuted, I know it's not real persecution like some people, you know, some saved people in other countries where, you know, you're being put in prison and you're being beaten to death and things. I know that. I, I know I've not been tortured by, you know, the Inquisition or something like this. I know that, but what I'm saying is it's a form of persecution. Excuse me, persecution when you have this big secular Google thing, you know, and they'll they'll allow all kinds of wickedness on YouTube, and and those wicked people are violating copyright stuff right and left, and yet you know you have somebody that actually owns the rights to royalty free music and things, and I put a video out about salvation, very gentle. I wasn't a jerk at all in the video, and they're you know putting monetized ads and things so you know it just I'm only putting that out there to show that you know their own hypocrisy is what I'm trying to show I know it's not like oh no I'm being persecuted I'm scared that stuff doesn't scare me you know um, but I just just wanted to put this thing together just to encourage you just to challenge you out there uh, to, to continue in the things of the Lord to continue fighting um, don't give up hope in the rapture. Don't don't give up. I mean, I've seen this thing. So many people they they get scared because they think Jesus should have come before now and he hasn't come yet, so he's not going to come. And you start getting scared. You start to fear man more than you fear God. Um, don't do that. Okay. Um, we can trust in the Word of God. We have a sure foundation um, in this book right here. This our King James Bibles. We can know for sure that uh, the Lord is going to, what His plans are for the future, that He's going to take care and He's going to judge everybody out there. Okay, so just wanted to put this one together to encourage everybody out there. Uh, we're going to have some interesting studies coming up here in the future, working pretty hard on that right now. So um, just in the kind of the interim between the studies coming out and, you know, uh, you know, just from now till they can come out, I just thought I'd put together this sermon um, just so... You know, just to encourage some of the brethren out there. But I think that's it for now as far as announcements or whatever are concerned. Um, again, just want to thank everybody for, for the prayers. Thank you to all who um, donate to the ministry. Uh, it's always a blessing to see how the Lord works through the body of Christ. Uh, it's, it's always amazing. You know, there are times when we'll have a bill come up and I'm thinking, how on earth am I going to pay for this or whatever? And some donation will come through and it'll be just exactly the right amount the right time everything just works out perfectly uh it's just like you know the lord just gives us what we need you know he supplies all of our need according to his riches and glory by christ jesus it's it's just amazing how the lord does that and um there have been many uh things where um, i have been afraid of of man in, in different situations and but I'm, I'm learning more and more to trust the lord and i can tell you just like david said I've never had to beg for bread or never had been totally left destitute. There have been times, yeah, we've gone through some rough times. There are times that you learn how, you know, to what was it Paul said there in Philippians, suffer need, how to suffer need. That, that happens sometimes, but you never get to a point where you're just totally destitute. The Lord just, sorry, can't help you. The Lord will always be there. He'll let you go through some of those bumpy times, you know, but uh, he'll always bring you out of it as long as you're trusting in him to get you through it so that's going to be it and we will see you in next week's study thank you for watching